Good afternoon, um, and thank you for joining the November Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston Board Meeting. At this time, the Boston Planning and Development Agency is continuing to host public meetings in a virtual setting for the health, safety, and accessibility of Boston residents. For more information and updates, visit bostonplans.org. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Files Channel 962. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov cable. I will now take a roll call of the members to begin this meeting. Uh, Mr. Monahan. Present. Dr. Landsmark. Present. Mr. Miller. Is not present yet. And I, uh, Priscilla Rojas, the chair, am present. Okay, let's start with um, the EDIC agenda item number one. Request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the October 13th, 2022 meeting. Uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number two, request authorization to award final designation status to Thompson Island Outward Bound Education Center Incorporated, Thompson Island Bound Education Center Incorporated for the, for the redevelopment and non-exclusive use of the Birth Number 10 dock and adjacent water sheet located within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park and to enter into a 10-year lease agreement for use of said property. Dennis. You're you're muted, Maureen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to be covering for Dennis today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, members of the board. For 10 in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park consists of approximately 5,000 square feet of water sheet. In 2018, BPDA issued an RFP, a request for proposals, for the redevelopment and long-term lease of the water sheet and any improvements thereon. The RFP required both, one, physical improvements to be made to the berth, and two, as a condition of the lease, the new lessee must provide access to Boston Harbor and the islands for City of Boston Public School students. Thompson Island Outward Bound was the sole respondent to the RFP. Thompson Island currently operates a water ferry which brings students to Thompson Island for educational activities. 60% of the students traveling to Thompson Island are City of Boston Public School students. Thompson Island was awarded tentative designation in 2019, subject to one, the success, successful installation of a new float, an ADA accessible ramp, and a landside shelter area for travelers waiting for the ferry. Pandemic restrictions had hindered successful fundraising, so the delivery had been delayed. At present, Thompson Island has succeeded in installing the improvements mentioned above, an investment of over $50,000, and to the satisfaction of BPDA engineering staff. The existing license expires on December 30th, 2022. Staff is now asking permission to enter into a new 10-year lease with Thompson Island. Use of the Birth 10 water sheet and landside shelter area shall be non-exclusive and the BPDA is free to allow other users access to the ramp and the float. However, Thompson Island's schedule will dictate the availability. Staff is currently recommending that the current lease rate of $975 per month continue for the first year of the new lease, then escalate by 3% per year for the balance of the lease. During the lease term, BPDA will receive $134,127, and more importantly, this unique educational program will continue to be available to City of Boston Public School students for at least the next 10 years. Thank you, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Thompson's Island will be uh, maintaining uh, the uh, uh, refurbished facility. Yes, they actually paid to make the improvements to it. So yes, they will uh, They will maintain it. Thank you. Okay. Additional questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second it. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. Item number three, request authorization to terminate the existing lease with Gentex Corporation to allow BPDA to recapture suite 901 located at 12 Channel Street within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Maureen. Thank you. Gentex is a designer and manufacturer specializing in U.S. military and domestic law enforcement, protective headgear and helmets. 
Gentex has been a tenant at 12 Channel Street since 2012, and the current lease expires in April 2024. In spring 2022, EPDA awarded tentative designation to related bill for the redevelopment of 22 Dry Dock Ave. EPDA, EPDA and related bill are in the final stages of negotiating the lease, which will be presented to the BPDA board in the near future. One condition of the lease with related bill will require BPDA to vacate 22 Dry Dock Ave and to deliver a vacant building. Meanwhile, earlier in 2022, Gentex approached BPDA to inquire about vacating their ninth floor space prior to the lease expiration. BPDA and Gentex were unable, unable initially to negotiate the fee required to vacate the space early. However, as a result of BPDA's commitment to vacate 22 Dry Dock Ave, BPDA re-engaged Gentex with an offer to allow Gentex to vacate the suite at no cost to Gentex as long as the space is delivered vacant to BPDA by April 30th, 2023. Accordingly, staff is proposing that the lease with Gentex be terminated one year early and end on April 30th, 2023. As a result of the early lease termination, BPDA will for forego over $500,000 in contract rent. However, the 22 Dry Dock Ave Life Science Development will ultimately generate over $6 million per year in rent to BPDA at stabilization. Staff is recommending lease termination because, one, the loss leader, for, loss leader for a much more lucrative transaction with related bail. Two, it allows Gentex to reduce its operating expenses by consolidating into a smaller facility in a cheaper market. And three, it allows BPDA to relocate to a strategic location that is reasonably close to both City Hall and its major property holdings, namely, namely the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park, China Trade Center, Long Wharf, Charlestown Navy Yard, and Bunker Hill Community College. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Uh, roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Item number four, request authorization to extend the lease agreement with Marine Engineers Beneficial Association for the use of approximately 3,200, or. 3,210 square feet on the sixth floor of 12 Channel Street, Suite 606, located within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Maureen. Thank you. The Marine Engineers Benevolent Association, also called MEBA, is the oldest and largest maritime officers union in the United States, has been a tenant at 12 Channel Street, Suite 606, since 1995. MEBA uses Suite 606 as a meeting hall and as an office to support the maritime job development functions of the labor union. In November 2016, the BPDA board approved a lease extension with MEBA for a single six-year term, which commenced on December 1st, 2016, and will expire on November 30th. Staff is now recommending a six-year extension with one five-year option to extend. MEBA shall pay rent, fixed rent for the six-year extension calculated at $20 per square foot for the entire 3,210 square foot suite. The fixed rent shall increase annually by, by $1 per square foot. Additionally, MEBA has expressed a desire to make improvements to Suite 606, including the installation of new windows, the installation of an AC or HVAC unit, and the new carpeting. BPDA's business model is to provide 12 Channel Street suites in their as-is condition, with any interior improvements being the sole responsibility of the tenant. Rent is reflect above that model. However, BPDA is motivated to assist MEBA in making the energy efficiency improvements towards BPDA's climate action strategy. Accordingly, BPDA will reduce the fixed rent to the rates identified below upon successful completion of the window replacement, the AC or HVAC installation, and carpet installation identified above at MEBA's expense. Presuming that the above reference improvements are completed by November 30th, 2023, MEBA shall be offered a reduced rent commencing December 1st, 2023, and for the remaining five-year balance of the term, which would allow MEBA to attribute over $114,000 in rental savings towards the improvement. Commencing on December 1, 2023, MEBA shall pay the higher of $21 per square foot, increasing by $1 per square foot per year, or $15.16 per square foot, increasing by 3.5% per year depending on MEBA's ability to timely perform the required improvements. Staff is recommending that we extend the lease agreement with MEBA for the use of 12 Channel Street, Suite 606. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. 
Any questions or comments from the board? Nope. Hearing seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. I, item number five, request authorization to award a contract to Clow Harbor and Associates LLP to provide design drawings and construction documents for the security systems for 12 Channel Street building and the 12 Dry Dock Avenue parking garage within the Raymond, El the Raymond Elfland Marine Park in an amount not to exceed $124,000. William. Thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, we are requesting authorization to execute that design contract with Clow Harbor and Associates, a design firm uh, known as DHA. The building security project in the Marine Park, both at the 12 channel building as well as the parking garage. This matter was last before you. We got the February board earlier this year. The design contract will provide design and construction oversight for improvements to the existing building security systems, uh, replacing some of the cameras, installing new cameras, and uploading these cameras to a cloud based system uh, in collaboration with the city of Boston. Uh, we issued the request for qualifications uh, July of this past year. 54 interested parties downloaded the RFP, and we got two proposals. Uh, this one was selected as the most advantageous by the Designer Selection Committee, and after a fee negotiation process, we landed on a contract value of $124,815, which has been appropriately budgeted for in the current fiscal year capital budget. So therefore, we are requesting authorization for the director to execute this contract with CHA. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Mm -hmm. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Seconded. I'll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number six. Thank you. Uh, request authorization to execute an engineering services contract with Child Engineering Corporation for the Waterfront Infrastructure Survey and Assessment at EDIC-owned properties in an amount not to exceed $68,700. Uh, William. Thanks again. Uh, so this matter was last before you at the August board earlier this year. It is for a Waterfront Infrastructure uh, Investigation. And this presentation is similar to one that we will give later in the evening for the DRA. This is looking at the EDIC Waterfront property. Uh, Childs Engineering is being hired to look at all of our waterfront infrastructure, do some underwater diving, and identify any needs for us that are not currently known and help us plan for those needs and prioritize them uh, for future capital budgets. Uh, so we issued the request for proposals earlier this year in September. We had 71 interested parties downloading the RFP. We received four proposals, and after a, a thorough review process, we identified Childs as the most advantageous. Uh, this contract award is for $68,700, and again, it has been appropriately budgeted for in the current uh, fiscal year budget, and therefore we are requesting authorization for the director to execute this contract with Child's Engineer. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Okay, and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Seconded. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you again. Item number seven, request authorization to amend the authorization required for the Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston check signing and disbursement procedures. Michelle. Good afternoon, excuse me. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Chief Jemerson, uh, Madam Secretary, and Michelle Goldberg, Director of Finance. I do actually have a uh, vote matter request for you today. We have been reviewing our internal procedures. Uh, it came to our attention that uh, we hadn't revisited a board authorization for check signers since 2009. So we felt uh, it was due for an update. Uh, and therefore, we seek the board uh, board's vote to um, update uh, who might be signing our checks to include the EDIC chair, EDIC treasurer, and any of the uh, other three EDIC members, the director, executive secretary, and director of finance. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Any questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. And item number eight, Michelle. 
uh, fiscal year 2022, or yeah, 2022, end of year, and FY23 Q1 equitable procurement and finance update. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is the fun part. Uh, today I have for your, your uh, for a report our first quarter for the fiscal year 23. Uh, we first will review performance against our equitable procurement plan. Next we have a brief look at how fiscal 2022 ended and a summary of activities in fiscal year's first quarter for 23. Next slide, please. One more after that. Thank you. The board requires that the director of finance provide a financial report on a quarterly basis. This body also holds the equitable procurement plan or EPP. That plan requires that the quarterly financial report include reporting on outcomes for the EPP. We have five areas of focus, including the overall design of the procurement process, data collection, community outreach, of course, accountability and resource allocation. When these fundamental areas come together to drive our work, we are able to achieve great outcomes. Next slide, please. And so I'm pleased to share this work with you. The Equitable Procurement Plan has provided a framework for the BPDA to direct resources like staffing and technology investments into this process. With the structure, we have been able to move the entire BPDA spending portfolio to be in line with market availability. An appendix to this presentation includes the baseline results from our 2020 disparity study. At that time, the BPDA had only 1.5% of our eligible spend with minority firms. As of the close of the first quarter, so not including tonight's actions, but from October board, uh, the BPDA is spending 1.8 million with minority owned firms. I'd like to point out that only one of those 10 uh, sort of firms are self-identified. These are all fully certified firms. Um, we've been able to achieve this uh, without reducing our women-owned firms, and they still continue to perform strong against the market. Um, it's so exciting to see this program come to life and be successful right at the onset. Soon, our, our focus will turn to sustaining this performance and building out reports to track this work over time. Thank you to everyone who has contributed to this, and thank you to this body for your leadership in the space. Now we can move to the finance portion. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> there's one more slide. Um, these are the uh, outreach and engagement by the numbers. Um, and so we track these just on a 90 day process. It doesn't quite align with quarters. Um, but what I would like to point out here is that out of the 97, uh, 967 MBE vendors that we reached out to, five actually responded to bids and that's a pretty good response rate. And so that's another data point that we're gonna continue um, to track over time. And out of those five that responded, we were able to award to two. Um, so these are kind of early indications that um, participation is up as well. Uh, now we can skip to the next slide, please. And we can go to the data tables. Um, so this is just a quick peek at FY22, and we can skip over to the highlight pages. Next slide, please. Lease and rentals ended ahead of budget. We had fairly conservative numbers coming out of the pandemic. Additional rent was ahead of the budget as well due to some one-time transactions. Parking revenue ended ahead of budget, and um, we have adjusted that parking, uh, those projections going into FY23. Equity participation was ahead of budget as well. Uh, nonetheless, BRA did receive an intercompany grant towards the end of the year. On the expense side, salary spending was a bit below budget. We had vacancies that we, uh, this board has supported us filling in the past few months. Um, and so we started FY23 uh, much closer to budget. Contractual services, uh, you know, grant activity with OWD continued throughout the year. Um, and we had quite a bit of activity in our property management line, yet we're still um, doing some spending on building 108, so that continues. Next slide, please. So for FY23, we'll see our tables here, and then we can go to the next slide for the updates. 
Again, um, lease and rentals are having a strong first quarter. Um, the budget anticipated this increase and we will continue to focus on this throughout the year. Parking is performing strong as well. And I have a follow-up slide for folks to take a look at after this. Um, equity participation is carrying along right on budget. Grants, we're seeing a little bit of a, a timing um, shift happening in the first quarter. This is very normal. Um, federal grants tend to get finalized in October. Um, and so uh, on the expense side, OWD has stepped up in anticipation of these grants coming in. And so we imagine that this will settle in the second quarter. Uh, employee benefits are, are right on track and contractual spending um, is gonna start to tick up as we approach the middle of the year. We can move to the next slide, please. Uh, as you'll see, parking continues to be um, a very good source of revenue for the agency. Um, we uh, have a couple lines here, so I'll just let folks know the, the uh, total budget uh, is the black dotted line, and so that's what the BPDA carried for our official budget. Um, we work with a third party. They provide projections as well, so that's that green dotted line. Um, and we can see that transient and monthly parking um, has had a lot of activity in the past few months, and we look forward to October's numbers. Finally, we have um, a very high level capital table on our next slide. Um, you'll see that we had set an aggressive budget for FY22 at $25 million. Uh, we have seen some spending in the first quarter, uh, and we do anticipate uh, that this will, oh, excuse me, sorry. The FY22 budget was 25 million, and then the 23 budget was 15. We spent 1.1 this quarter. Um, we are working um, very closely with the real estate department, and as you know, you guys are very regularly approving contracts for both design and construction, and so uh, these numbers will tick up throughout the year. Next slide. So after that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Okay, well, again, a uh, great presentation, very concise, um, and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. Uh, so with that, uh, oh, actually, that was just informational, so no, no, <laughs> no vote needed. Um, great, so item number nine, personnel. Thank you, um, <coughs> excuse me, thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Jemison. Uh, we have a number of items for your consideration on the EDIC agenda with the complete details included in the board memos. We have nine appointments in the accounting and finance department is Heather uh, Bikavich, accountant one, and Yergamal McConan, finance assistant for small business in corporate financing. In the office of workforce development, Shanique Joseph, communications manager, and Jessica Bruno, financial coach and career specialist. In the real estate department, Emma Bird, senior real estate development officer. In the IT department, Justin Liu, graphic designer. In the research department, Michael Endale, senior researcher, data scientist. In the urban design department, Breeze Outlaw, urban designer too. In the planning department, Amy Chambers, director of planning. We have one contract in the office of workforce development, Mallory Jones. We have one status change in the planning department, Ken and Ryan from Deputy Director of Downtown and Neighborhood Planning to Interim Director of Planning. We also have two out-of-state travel requests, and uh, we have seven departures to report. In the Office of Workforce Development, Brian Norton, Deputy Director for Labor Policy, Bethany Sirota, Deputy Director Workforce Equity, Caitlin Gossett, Deputy Director Labor Compliance, and Mallory Jones, Assistant Director of YOU. In the Planning Department, Jared Staley, Planner 2. In the Real Estate Department, Anthony Varani, Real Estate Development Officer. And finally, in the Finance Department, Stephanie Santos, Procurement Specialist, Operations. Thank you, and I'll answer any questions you may have. Okay, hey, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Seconded. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Uh, and the turtle's aye. Motion passes. Uh, so that was the final item. I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. Uh, 
I move that we adjourn the EDIC meeting. Seconder. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Meeting, motion passes, meeting adjourned. Okay, uh, moving on to the BPDA portion of the meeting. <clears throat> Thank you for joining the November Boston Redevelopment Authority board meeting. At this time, the Boston Planning and Development Agency is continuing to host public meetings in a virtual setting for the health, safety, and accessibility of Boston residents. For more information and updates, visit bostonplans.org. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Files Channel 962. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov slash cable. I will now take a roll call to begin this meeting. Uh, Mr. Monahan. Present. Mr. Lansmark. Present. And I, uh, Mr. Rojas, am present. Okay, let's start with item number one. Request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the October 13th, 2022 meeting. A motion is in order. So moved. Seconder. Uh, roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number two. Request authorization to schedule a public hearing on December 15, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. or at 8.00 in time determined by the director to consider the development plan and development area number 134, the Longwood Place project located in the Longwood Medical Area. A motion is in order. So moved. Seconder. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number three, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on December 15th, 2022 at 5.40 p.m. or at a date and time determined by the director to consider the development plan for the planned development area number 137, 41 Berkeley Street, Project Development, South End, and to consider the proposed project as a development impact project. Uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number four, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on December 15, 2022 at 5.50 p.m. or at a date and time determined by the director to consider the 119 Brain Street, Brain Tree Street project as a development impact project. A motion is in order. So moved. Seconder. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number five, Request authorization to schedule a public hearing on, no on December 15, 2022 at 6 p.m. or at a date and time determined by the director to consider the Fifth Amendment to the Development Plan for Plan Development Area Number 67, Olmstead Green, located in the Dorchester and Mattapan neighborhoods. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number six. Request authorization to schedule a public hearing on December 15, 2022 at 6.10 p.m. or at a date and time determined by the director to consider the Institutional Master Plan Vacation Form filed for the Fifth Amendment to the 2013 Institutional Master Plan for Harvard University's campus in Alston. A motion is in order. So move. Seconder. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number seven. Request authorization to schedule a public hearing on December 15, 2022 at 6.20 p.m. or at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the First Amendment to amended and restated development plan for planned development area number 78 Seaport Square Project. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number eight, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on December 15th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. or at a date and time determined by the director to consider the development plan for phase one within the plan development area number 128, uh, 776 Summer Street project and the proposed phase one project as a development impact project. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Do Landsmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, agenda item number nine, uh, Board of Appeal. Um, Jeffrey, 
Uh, well, take a sip of water there. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Board of Appeal. Do this. Thank you again, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Madam Secretary, Director Jameson. 56 petitions have been prepared for you uh, by planning staff and transmittal to the Board of Appeal. Uh, these 56 will cover four meetings, uh, two in November and two in December. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, you too. Um, Okay, item number 10 is an informational update on the Compact Living Pilot um, Program. Michelle. Hello, and thank you, Chairwoman Rojas, Secretary Polhemas, Director Jemison, and members of the board. I'm Michelle McCarthy, Deputy Director of Housing Policy and Compliance, here before you today to provide a brief update about the city's Compact Living Pilot, including the intent to extend the pilot until May 30th, 2023, and then sunset the, the policy in order to engage in a comprehensive study. There's no vote today on this item. Just for background, the Compact Living Pilot, or CLP, allows for the creation of smaller dwelling units when coupled with certain amenities and transportation features. This pilot was created by the Housing Innovation Lab in conjunction with the Mayor's Office of Housing, the Boston Transportation Department, and the BPDA. The purpose of this CLP was to create an opportunity for the city to study whether the Compact Living Design Standards increase housing affordability, build community, promote sustainable development, and or encourage creativity. In October 2018, the board, this board authorized the director to sign a letter detailing CLP requirements to be in place as a pilot for a period of two years. In November 2022, the board was then provi again provided with an update on the CLP and the intent to extend the pilot for another two-year period. At that time, the extension of the CLP was needed because no projects had been approved under the pilot. Uh, no projects had received a certificate of occupancy under the pilot, rather, so there was no ability to study the effectiveness of the policy. Currently, there are two projects that have been approved under the CLP that have received their certificate of occupancy with an additional 15 projects under construction. Again, the impacts of the CLP have been unable to be studied during the two-year extension period because a larger sample size of projects is needed. Rather than recommend the CLP be extended for another two-year period, the city has concluded that this pilot should sunset on May 30th, 2023. After that period, proposed projects submitting letters of intent for small project review applications must comply with existing size minimums. Once a critical mass of projects is approved under the CLP and occupied, approved and occupied under the CLP, the policy will be evaluated and a decision made with regard to whether or not to make this pilot permanent. If and when a permanent compact living policy is put into place, a vote from this board will be sought. That concludes my update. I'm joined today by Michael Cadizzo, Deputy Director of Urban Design, and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay. Um, thank you so much for the uh, for the update. We look forward to uh, you know getting more data on the occupancy and, and seeing how this did. So uh, great work. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, item number 11, uh, another informational update, uh, the Life, Science, Life Sciences Action Agenda. Ella. Good evening, Madam Chair, Rojas, Secretary Bohemus, and members of the board. My name is Ella Wise, and I'm the Planning and Development Review Coordination Manager at the BPDA. I'm honored to present the recently released Life Sciences Action Agenda. Next slide, please. Boston is home to a booming life sciences industry. The BPDA welcomes continued growth and encourages developers and companies to set their roots in Boston in, a, in an effort to support the industry's built environment needs while addressing concerns from the public in relation to the location and design of these developments. The BPDA released uh, the Life Sciences Action Agenda this week. Next slide, please. For context, Life sciences development is critical to Boston's economy and public services. On the left-hand side of your screen, you can see that our research division estimates that the number of jobs in life sciences has grown by 50% in the past 10 years, sustained growth. But it's not only about jobs, it's also about public services. For example, in terms of affordable housing and job training, 
new commercial developments such as life sciences buildings pay linkage fees as you know that fund these critical resources next slide at the same time members of the public and elected officials have raised concerns about the potential impacts of life sciences development for example there are concerns about closed off ground floors noise and environmental impacts and safe and convenient mobility the bpa is committed to addressing these through thoughtful planning and design in addition the bpda has heard concerns from residents about health and safety impacts we will continue to work closely and support our sister agencies in public health fire and inspections those agencies responsible for regulating these health and safety considerations Similarly, we will coordinate with partners across the city to improve equity and access to jobs in the life sciences and continue to work towards increasing housing, opportun uh, housing opportunities to support the growing workforce at all income levels. On the subject of health and safety, we wanted to acknowledge the ecosystem. Oh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to acknowledge the full ecosystem of regulators at the city, state, and federal level. BPDA is only one part of a comprehensive set of regulations and professionals and experts. I also want to take this time to note that we're honored to have the Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Planning at the Boston Public Health Commission join us this afternoon. Mr. PJ McCann here is, um, is here this evening to help answer any questions related to the work of the BPHC. Next slide. <clears throat> so given this context, what's our agenda? We have four main strategies. One, shape life sciences development through new, uh, new life sciences design guidelines. We'll release these guidelines and begin engagement in the next three months. Second, we'll guide development with new zoning language. You can expect to see draft zoning amendments in the next eight months, at which time we'll begin community engagement for review and feedback. We'll plan for the future as we, continue, as we always do. This work is already underway in our ongoing neighborhood plans, such as Plan Charlestown. And finally, we'll partner with sister agencies as we already are who really are the experts to ensure public health and, and safety. We'll release an interactive map of life sciences development for greater transparency. We'll continue pursuing best practices for working with our sister agencies and interdisciplinary uh, coordination. And we'll provide community engagement opportunities, new community engagement opportunities uh, to talk more broadly and holistically about life sciences in the city. Next slide. So with that, um, I invite you to view the full action agenda and learn more about upcoming community engagement opportunities at the link on the screen. With that, I'll take questions. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Do we have any way of uh, knowing how many Boston residents are actually employed in these new uh, life sciences developments? Thanks for that question. So um, I have, uh, I'm not prepared with the exact number, to be honest, um, uh, but I can certainly respond with that. We do, the research division has that number, and I think in a couple of minutes I can respond to that. Thank you. And I recognize it's complex. Uh, it's a complex number because people will move into Boston to work for them. Um, and there may not be a way of correlating um, uh, who has uh, uh, come out of Boston and is now employed there, but it would be useful to know those numbers. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So how do the new guidelines or, or uh, you know, protocols of our sister agencies uh, address proximity of life sciences building and lab space to residential locations, um, and in particular, the sharing of party walls. Great, thank you for that question. So the BBDA recently convened our sister agencies, Public Health Commission, Fire Department, Inspectional Services, Environment Department, 
Office of Community Engagement to discuss life sciences, and particularly the location and siting of, of labs in the city. We've also conducted interviews with sister cities and facilities managers, and the, based on the expertise of sister agencies, BPDA is confident in the location of biosafety uh, BSL-1 and 2 labs adjacent to non-lab uses, including residential. But since we have Deputy Commissioner McCann on the call, I'm happy to turn it over to him as the real expert in health and safety. Yeah, thank you, Ella, and, and thank you to the board for, for having me here tonight. I would agree. I, I think the um, the only thing that I would add is that you know once once a building space is built, there are you know sort of measures in place to make sure that those spaces are being used responsibly. So you know, in addition to BPHC's ability to go in and conduct inspections, we also have the Boston Fire Department that regulates the types of chemicals and amounts of chemicals that can be used to make sure that they're used safely. And in addition to that, the, um, the Inspectional Services Department from a, a building code compliance perspective can make sure that, that spaces that need to be separated from each other can be. But I can, I can sort of share that in our experience since you know, regulating, regulating biosafety labs over the past, um, throughout our history, um, and, and, and especially since, uh, since the 2006 uh, local Boston biosafety regulations, we haven't had any incidents that it have involved pathogens moving between one building space and, uh, and another adjacent space. So I, you know, I can appreciate the community concern, but um, but our our focus is is much more on the safety of the work being done in the lab and making sure that you know any occupational exposures that that do happen in the lab receive a quick follow up from us. Okay, so so then who's who's whose jurisdiction is it to to for the I guess the outside of the lab. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think what I would say is, you know, is you know, we are rightly addressing deciding decisions before this body. I think you can think of DPHC and you know, and, and fire as uh, oversight over the operation of labs, and that is sort of the, the how the work is being done in the lab really is the primary um, area of risk and it's the primary focus of our uh, our regulatory oversight. Okay, and the I guess the you know when you are sharing a party wall like with with the building, I guess who sets the I guess the parameters or the guidelines or the the um, the rules, right? For uh, what's what's needed on the in-betweens, you know, uh, in between the buildings when you're sharing a wall. Yes, I can say from from sort of the the biosafety regulation perspective, some of that depends on on what what biosafety level we're talking about. If it's if it's a biosafety four lab, or let's say two, one and two is most is mostly what we get. So. Right, and, and and again, so with with biosafety level two labs, the the containment that's that's required is sort of a a closed and lockable door, and that the work is being done in um, you know depending on the the, the type of of uh, organism that you're that you're studying, that the, that the work is being sort of done on a bench that that adequately contains it. But you know, just for you know, and a, a lot of this information is included in the in the action agenda, but. Um, you know, sort of the the thinking with the biosafety levels one and two is that um, you know these are this is work that's being done on the organisms that are already in the the sort of the the community and that that we have known um, that we have known um, prophylaxis for and cures for so that's why there's sort of the 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 purpose built you know you know, much more separated uses for level threes and level fours are appropriate for um, for those more dangerous pathogens and, and level two we're really mostly concerned um, or primarily concerned about um, needle sticks or any type of mouse bite that might result in an infection and um, and ensuring that there's no subsequent infection. It's, there's, there's far less concern with um, with those types of organisms getting through a wall or getting into a space that's not um, 
not immediately associated with the lab table that they're working in. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry for the multiple questions. I'm just trying to understand. So, so are there like are there rules like if you are sharing a party wall like of what needs to go? And, and I mean, obviously, I'd be completely transparent, right? Right. We've got projects before us, right? We have to evaluate them and the design and stuff. So I just want to know, like, are there set rules of like how you know? what needs to happen to that party wall to kind of make it safe or am I just not yeah so I, again I, w I would come back to you know the, the the way the building is built and making sure that those walls are sound is sort of the domain of um of the building code and and of uh you know making sure that the building is is built to the spec and that the space that the lab is in is um is in its own space and that it is in a, a sort of contained area but Okay. Again, sort of the, the risk of, of migration from one uh, and, and, you know, protocols do require that doors be closed during the during the research. But again, this is, this is research on, um, you know, it's, it's on yep. organisms that we that we know and know how to treat. So again, it's 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 mostly about making sure that that the way that the, the work is done is appropriate for the level of um, the level of organism that you're working with. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions or comments from the board or any other comments from the agency? I would just add um, uh, board members that the uh, that as part of the work, um, Ella also reached out to, Ms. Wise, I should say, also reached out to uh, Cambridge uh, to sort of speak with their um, public health and building professionals to uh, learn uh, more about what their experience had been uh, with uh, with this topic, and you know, was, that was one of the reasons that the, the recommendation of SL one and two um, was included, was because our, our uh, other municipalities have, with their special services and public health agencies, been able to uh, have um, party wall conditions with between lab and residential successfully, um, and so we learned a little bit from that. Um, it, Ella, if you don't, if there's anything else you want to add to that, otherwise I would. I'll close my comment and pass it back to you. Yeah, great. Just so in addition to speaking with our history agencies within Boston, speaking with uh, planning staff in Cambridge, as well as life sciences facilities managers who are very familiar with the industry, assuring us in, you know, that adds to our confidence that PSL one and two labs next to residential units uh, uses we can be confident of the safety and health of those uh, of that location. Okay, thank you. Uh, very very happy to see that we have um, you know published these these guidelines and we continue to work with them. So uh, so best of luck in that. And uh, this doesn't need a vote, so it's just an informational update. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Item number 12, request authorization to adopt Mayor Michelle Wu's executive order entitled An Order Relative to the Speeding the Production of Affordable Housing dated October 6, 2022, setting forth the goal of cutting in half the approval process timeline for from filing through Article 80 to the Zoning Board of Appeal uh, approval. So, uh, Ruben. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary members of the board, Chief Jamison, for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Ruben Cantor. I'm the Senior Advisor for Strategy and Operations. And I have been tasked alongside Devin Quirk, Caitlin Coppinger, Brian Glasscock, and other BPDA leaders with facilitating the agency's response to the mayor's October 6th executive order entitled an order relative to speeding the production of affordable housing. I'm here this afternoon to request BPDA board adoption of the order. Next slide, please. The mayor's order sets a goal of cutting in half the timeline for the review and approval processes on projects where at least 60% of units are income restricted. This order impacts the wide array of city departments that are involved in project approvals with special emphasis on BPDA and ZPA review and approval processes. Next slide, please. 
The order is made up of five articles, each of which have requirements impacting BPDA and the Mayor's Office of Housing in particular, and the two agencies have been working closely together to meet the order's goals. Article 1 emphasizes that all agencies involved in the review and approval processes will put in place inter and intra departmental policies and procedures to prioritize affordable housing projects. MOH has taken the lead on this article. Next slide, please. Article 2 requires that by February 6th, BPDA will put forward for the mayor's consideration recommended changes to the Article 80 process for qualified projects. Next slide, please. Article 3 requires that the BPDA put before the mayor recommendations to the zoning code in order to streamline affordable housing approvals. We've been studying the data to determine the most prevalent zoning code triggers for ZBA to guide our work. And we are also studying zoning changes adopted by other cities in the region and around the country that are facilitating faster affordable housing development. Next slide, please. Article 4 requires that MOH and BPDA work together with other agencies to coordinate our data tracking systems to ensure that we can properly measure progress towards the order's goals. Next slide, please. Article 5 requires the establishment of an Affordable Housing Development Review Advisory Committee made up of both internal and external representatives to provide guidance on meeting the goals of the order. The Mayor's Office of Housing is leading this effort. The last slide, please. This order places its focus on cutting in half the timeline for projects that are large enough to go through Article 80 and include at least 60% affordable units. It focuses on streamlining Article 80 and ZBA. We have already seen agencies before the city utilizing the intent of this order to rethink the review and approval processes for both affordable and market rate projects, even outside the specific scope of the order. We are grateful for the strong levels of cooperation across agencies generated as a result of this order. We are seeking adoption by the BPDA board of the mayor's executive order. We are not at this time proposing any specific changes. Proposed changes to Article 80 and zoning will be brought back before the BPDA board and the zoning commission for consideration. Thank you for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Thank you. <clears throat> any questions or comments from the board? What kind of data do we have on um, how long it's taking now? Right, so we are finding that it takes a little bit under a year to go through uh, initial board vote from uh, initial filing to initial board vote um, and uh, uh, through uh, the ZBA approval. So it takes about six to seven months for each of those processes um, and combined it takes just under a year is what we're finding on um, qualified uh, projects. So, six, so for the last five years of projects, um, that uh, have 60% uh, or more uh, affordable units. And could you comment, you may not be able to, but could you comment on what the uh, longest elements of, of those, uh, uh, that time period might be? What's I, the essence of the delay? I don't know if I can name a single essence of delay, because I think each project we're finding has uh, some variability uh, in terms of, of, you know, some projects have the, the NPCs, and so that delays them. Um, we're seeing some projects require multiple community meetings uh, uh, or multiple um, IAGs. I, you know, I don't think that we have identified a single um, uh, item that if we just did this one thing, it would change the whole uh, environment. I think we're going to have to look at, at all of our processes and, and rethink them to, to see if we can uh, bump these up our priority level and, and see if we can streamline those, uh, those timelines. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions or comments? I have, a same, I have this kind of a similar question, Madam Chair. Ruben, it's just coming from a different direction. So if you want to attack one of the items in the process, which one do you think? Which again, I'm in favor of this because I think it takes too long. Developers miss economic windows and everything else, so I'm in favor of it. So, uh, how would which one do you think would be the one that would be? Yeah, I, I I feel like it's too early for me to preview. We're still in the research uh, stage here, and I think we we have more work to do um, uh, before we can come to to some conclusions. So I apologize that I can't be more specific, but that's that's where I think we're at right now. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, well, let's speed up this vote so we can see. <laughs> um, so um, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you.
Okay, item number 13. Request authorization to extend the license agreement with Chinese Historical Society of New England Incorporated to display a temporary public-facing bilingual exhibition on street-level windows at the China, China Trade Building located at 2 Boylston Street in Chinatown. Lauren. Madam Chairwoman, members of the board, Initially approved by the BPDA board at the June 14th, 2022 meeting, the public facing bilingual exposition Endurance Street is a collaboration between the Chinese Historical Society of New England and the Tisch Public Humanities Program at Tufts University. It is inspired by the economic distress and racially motivated attacks that have impacted Boston's Chinese speaking neighborhood during the pandemic. Due to the positive response from the community, BPDA staff is recommending an extension through the end of the school year or through June 30th, 2023. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions for the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Nance Mark. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Item number 14, request authorization to enter into a lease agreement with English for New Bostonians for the use of approximately 2,783 square feet on the first floor, suites 109 and 110 at the China Trade Building located at 2 Boylston Street in Chinatown. Lauren. Thank you. I'm here today asking that the director be authorized to enter into a lease with English for New Bostonians for approximately 2,783 square feet which are suites 109 and 110 at the China Trade Building to Boylston Street. English for New Bostonians began in 2001 as an initiative driven by the Boston's Mayor's Office for Immigrant Advancement with the Office of Workforce Development, local foundations, and immigrant leaders. English for New Bostonians was launched to address the need for English speakers of other languages to serve our city's immigrant communities and expand better and better coordinate Boston's ESOL system. Staff proposes a five-year term commencing on January 1st, 2023 and expiring on December 31st, 2027. ENB shall have one three-year option to extend the lease at fair market value by providing the landlord with at least one year written notice. ENB accepts the premises in its as-in condition and will coordinate with BPDA staff and Colliers International to appropriately condition the space for their use. The cost of all work is the responsibility of ENB unless required for the maintenance of the building. Inasmuch as ENB will be financially responsible for all improvements to the space and will also provide appropriate in-kind services to City of Boston residents on an as-needed basis, no fee is proposed for the first two years of the lease. Beginning year two, ENB will pay a proportional share of any increase of the building operating expenses and will be assessed a market rate value of $25 a square foot beginning year three. With escalations, EPDA will collect $217,101 during the five-year term. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Request authorization to allow International Institute of New England to sublease approximately 1,000 square feet of space in Suite 301 at the China Trade Building located at 2 Boylston Street to the United States Committee for Refugees and Immigrants to provide administrative support for the Trafficking Victims Assistance Program services. Lauren. Thank you again. Since 2016, International Institute of New England has leased approximately 14,000 square feet on the third floor of China Trade and are currently in year seven of a 10-year agreement. IINE creates opportunities for refugees and immigrants to succeed through resettlement, education, career advancement, and pathways to citizenship. Additionally, their Boston office provides case management for tra trafficking victim assistance. The federal agency that administers the TVAP program is now requiring IINE National Office and the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants to manage the work directly. As a result, IINE proposes to sublease approximately 1,000 square feet of space in Suite 301 to the United States Committee for Refugees and Immigrants 
to provide administrative support for the Trafficking Victims Assistance Program service. The sublease will be for one year beginning December 1st, 2022, with additional one-year options permittable through the end of the current lease term. Since the fixed rate paid by both IINE and USCRI is the same per square foot rate, there will be no additional revenue paid to the BPDA for the sublease. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Ian Smart. Aye. Mr. Chair, that's aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. All right, item number 16. Request authorization to enter into five consultant services contracts with Cynthia M. Barr Esquire, Dream Collaborative LLC, Helmuth Obata and Kasabum PC over under and uh, Util Incorporated for the land use planning and rezoning services in amount not to exceed $700,000 uh, with an additional one year extension option. Kenan. Good afternoon. Uh, oh, I think my camera's off. Hold on. Here we go. Had it off, uh, double off there. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Director Golden, Secretary Palhimas. Uh, I'm here today to request that the director be authorized to enter into five independent contracts for the land use planning and rezoning services con um, contract. So on September 15th, 2022, the BPDA board authorized the secretary to advertise and issue an RFP to engage up to five consultant services for this contract. Selected respondents um, whereas it will be assigned work through a series of discrete work orders going forward. Planning division staff will draft a scope of work and associated timeline before requesting a specific response to each work order um, from the selected respondents. You could think of this sort of like an on-call services contract. Uh, the BPDA received 12 proposals. The 12 proposals received were responsive and responsible, met their quality requirements, and satisfied the minimum threshold criteria. The 12 proposals were evaluated based on the comparative evaluation criteria, um, which included respondent team qualifications, project manager qualifications, land use planning, spatial planning and zoning experience, and social equity and resilience planning experience. To each of the evaluation criteria stated above, a rating of highly advantageous, advantageous, not advantageous, or unacceptable was assigned. These ratings were used afterwards to assign a composite rating for each, each proposal evaluated. The comparative evaluation criteria were applied by the evaluation committee, which included BPA planning staff, including myself, after a thorough evaluation of the respondents' proposals by the evaluation committee, a determination has been made the following teams submitted the most advantageous proposals, taking into consideration the comparative evaluation criteria and the fee proposal. I will say that all 12 respondents um, received a rating of advantageous, but these are the five that have the highest ratings. So the first, first is um, Cynthia M. Barr, who received a rating of highly advantageous. She'll be authorized to do services under the zoning um, services bucket within this contract. Dream Collaborative received a rating of advantageous. They will be authorized to do work under the land use planning and spatial planning categories. HOK, Helmuth, Obata, Kesabon, hope I didn't butcher that name, uh, received a rating of advantageous as well, and they will be authorized in all service categories. Over Under will also be um, also received an advantageous rating and will be authorized in all service categories. And finally, UTL received a highly advantageous rating and will also be authorized in all service categories. The awarded contract shall be for one year with the BPD holding an option for a one year extension that we can exercise at our sole discretion. Each selected respondent will enter into a contract in the amount not to exceed $700,000. However, the selected contractors are not guaranteed the total value of the of the contract as the aggregate program budget will be capped at $700,000. The program budget will be based on specific projects that arise during the contract term um, and the aggregate will not exceed $700,000 over that two year period. The resulting contract will be funded through the BPA operating budget. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Are these five uh, distributing their work based on geography or subject matter or 
This will be, this will be um, distributed based on need at that moment in time and based on expertise or specialties. So for example, if we're looking to do any type of zoning amendment and need to supplement staff time, um, we have two, two participants, well, but we have four teams qualified to do that work. Um, whereas if we're looking to do something that maybe has more of a spatial planning, urban design focus, we have a different set of teams qualified for that work. So it's kind of as it comes up over the next year. Thanks. Additional questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. Uh, so moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lansmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. Um, item number 17, request authorization to execute an engineering services contract with Child's Engineering Corporation for the Waterfront Infrastructure Survey and Assessment at BRA owned properties in an amount not to exceed $40,300. William. Thank you again, Madam Chair and members of the board. This is the second half of the matter I presented earlier. This will address the BRA owned properties and do that waterfront infrastructure inspection, which will look at every Thing that's on our waterfront to determine any needs that we need to be aware of. Uh, the contract is with Child's Engineering, and this portion of the contract is for $40,000, $40,300. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Thanks, Mark? Aye. Okay, that's aye. Motion passes. Item number 18, request authorization to enter into a contract with Bargman Hendry uh, Plus Archetype Inc. to provide design services and construction administration for the design of building envelope repairs for the China Trade Center located at 2 Boylston Street in an amount not to exceed $100,000. Willie. Uh, thank you again. So yes, we are requesting authorization to award a contract to the design firm known as BH Plus A. Uh, this matter was last before you at the December 2021 uh, board. This design contract is for design services and construction oversight for improvements to the exterior building envelope of the China Trade Building. We have some masonry that needs to be repointed and repaired. We have some windows that need to be upgraded. Uh, all of this work is under the purview of the Boston Landmarks Commission. We are concurrently working uh, to extend their approval for the project. They've seen this before and given us an approval with provisos. We just need to extend that. Uh, we issued this RFP uh, in August of this year. We had 66 interested uh, participants downloading the RFP. We were pleased to receive six uh, proposals for the work. And after a thorough selection, uh, we determined that BH plus A uh, was the most advantageous. And we are also pleased that they are a certified uh, woman-owned business. The contract negotiations resulted in a design contract at even $100,000. And uh, with that, we are requesting authorization for the director to execute this contract, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Nance Mark? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 19, request authorization to execute a contract amendment for the additional arborist services provided by Northeastern Tree Service Incorporated in the amount not to exceed $39,400. Laura. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board for the opportunity to speak with you today. The first of several requests I'm presenting is an amendment to our arborist services contract, uh, which was approved by this board in September of 2020. Specifically, we're seeking to increase its value by 25%. Due to the as-needed nature of this work and our staff's tireless efforts to inspect our property, address safety concerns, and respond to residents, our initial budget estimate of $50,000 a year was insufficient. Amending the contract will help us complete seasonal maintenance and respond to any weather damage while simultaneously issuing a new expanded invitation for bids, which I'll present to you in the next few minutes. With that, thank you for your consideration and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the board? I can say none. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Lance Mark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 20 request authorization to execute a maintenance contract with Gone Green Electric Company Incorporated for electrical repair and maintenance of BRE owned properties in an amount not to exceed $75,000. Laura. 
Thank you once again, Madam Chair. Whether it's our trees or our electrical equipment, BP Day staff manage our property as though we live next door with the support of specialized contractors as needed. Therefore, I'm requesting authorization to award a contract for electrical repair and maintenance to Gone Green Electric Company. We received three bids for this work from a diverse group of bidders. Gone Green had the lowest bid price that met all our requirements, and they've done good work for us under previous contracts. Uh, therefore, I thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Lance Mark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 21, request authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals for the 2023 Downtown Waterfront Trolley Kiosk Program. Laura. Thank you, Chair Rojas. Thinking ahead to the spring and the summer, the Downtown Waterfront is a popular tourist destination and a valued location for trolley tour businesses with three kiosks available on BPDA-owned land in between Long and Central Wharves. Although not required to do so by law, we seek to issue a request for proposals to ensure as much publicity and participation as possible and to build on the industry's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. We've built flexibility into the RFP so the license terms can match the market and area needs. These fees help us maintain the property in the area. Uh, thank you once again, and please let me know if there are any questions. Questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Lance Mark? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Item number 22, request authorization to advertise and issue an invitation for bids for Arborist Services for Boston Redevelopment Authority owned citywide properties. Laura. Thank you for my final opportunity to present to the board today. As I mentioned earlier today, we rely on professional Arborist Services to care for our property. Um, and therefore, we're seeking authorization to advertise an issue, an invitation for bids with an expanded budget of $120,000 per year to match our current needs. The invitation for bid will be publicly advertised, including outreach to diverse firms, and the contract will be awarded to the lowest bidder who meets our requirements, including various industry certifications. Thank you once again, and uh, happy to answer any questions at this time. Okay, uh, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Lance Mark? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Laura. Okay, item number 23. Request authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals to engage a consultant to assist in the preparation of the downtown office conversion study. Uh, Andrew. Thank you, Madam Chair Rojas, Secretary Paul Hemus, and members of the board. Um, the, Madam, the downtown office conversion study is part of an um, overarching and ongoing effort to generate strategies that can revitalize downtown in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide. Uh, the recently released uh, Boston Consultant Group's downtown revitalization report identifies office conversion as a potential strategy for renewal and growth um, and activity downtown. Um, the feasibility will study will build off of this report, as well as coordinate closely with the recently relaunched plan downtown to assess immediate and long-term opportunity areas for office conversion. Uh, one of the primary goals of the study is to identify highly actionable funding and land use strategies to help successfully convert vacant downtown office spaces and identify viable uses, whether they be residential or um, life sciences. Uh, the contract will not exceed $100,000, and the duration will be six months. Um, the study will work closely um, alongside Plan Downtown, complementing its communication uh, approach and process, um, as well as uh, engage um, stakeholders in the area to discuss uh, interests and different perspectives on office conversion. Uh, thank you for your consideration, and happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments from the board? No, um, um, I'm glad we're doing this. <laughs> really comment. Um, okay, uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Lance Mark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Andrew. Item number 24. 
Uh, request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the Old Colony Phase 3B and 3C Chapter 121A project located at 271 East Street and 103 Mercer Street in South Boston. Uh, certificate of completion, so a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 25, request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the lab office building located at 105 West 1st Street in South Boston. Uh, it's a certificate of completion. Uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Landsmark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 26, request authorization to award tentative designation status to Diane Bell to facilitate the sale of the BRA owned property located at 20R Dacia Street in Roxbury for the construction of landscaped open space. Jonathan. Thank you, Madam Chair, Director Jimison, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. I'm here today to request authorization to award tentative designation to Diane Bell for BPA parcel 20 yard Dacia Street. On February 10th, the BPDA board approved a request to issue applications for the sale of three parcels through the, through the Butters Parcels Program, which was created to sell small, unbuildable BPDA-owned vacant land to Butters as deed-restricted open space. 20-yard mm -hmm. Dacia was one of the three parcels, parcels approved by the board that day and was the only parcel that is not an urban renewal parcel or in an urban renewal zone. 20-yard Dacia consists of 2,066 square feet of vacant land in the center of a residential and commercial block surrounded by Blue Hill Avenue, Dove Street, Quincy Street, and Dacia Street in the Bruns Brunswick King area of the Roxbury neighborhood. The parcel is landlocked, surrounded on all sides by abutters, and the only access to the land is by crossing private property. On December 8th, 2021, BPDA staff hosted a virtual community meeting to, do, to discuss the disposition of the parcel. The Butters and surrounding neighbors expressed their desire that the property be made available to the Butters to purchase, noting that the land has been maintained by Diane Bell's family for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Due to the, to the location of the parcel and the request made by the community, the BPDA staff decided to issue applications in the Butter Parcels Program. On March 21st, 2022, the BPDA made the applications for 20 yard data available to the direct abutters for 60 days. The application had a asking price for $25,000 for the parcel, which is the assessed value of the property. Diane Bell was the only abutter to submit an application and offered $1, $1 for the parcel. While the offer is low, the application allows for any offer price to be made for the parcel. Further, the proposed improvements to the land in Ms. Bell's application were deemed to be highly advantageous because they include keeping the parcel as open green space, planting a per perennial garden, new grass and tree replacements, installing a privacy fence and planters along the edges of the parcel, and installing, in, installing a, gaz a gazebo for shade and sitting. Based on the aforementioned, the BPD team recommends that the board award tentative designation to Diane Bell for 20 yard Dacia. With that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Hands Mark. Aye. And the two votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item number 27. Request authorization to enter into an affordable rental housing agreement and restriction in connection with the proposed development located at 25 Gardner Street and to take all related actions. Michelle. Hello again and thank you Chairwoman Rojas, Secretary Pohemus, Director Jemison and members of the board. For the record, I'm Michelle McCarthy, Deputy Director of Housing Policy and Compliance. I'm here before you today on 25 Gardner Street in Alston. This is a 14 unit rental project that received its Zoning Board of Appeal approval on J July 12, 2022 and does not require Article 80 approval. This project is here before you today because it will include three income restricted inclusionary development policy units. Your vote today is to authorize the execution of an affordable rental housing agreement and restriction. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Hands Mark. Aye. Mr. Vince, aye. Motion passes. Thanks. 
Uh, item number 28, request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E, Small Project Review, the Zoning Code, in connection with the notice of project change for the uh, 104 Canal Street Hotel project to increase the hotel rooms from 90 to 98, reduce the size of the guest cafe and refinements to the facade with EPDA Urban Design staff located at 104 Canal Street and to take all related actions. Erin. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison and Secretary Polhemis. My name is Erin Skibbins. I'm a new project assistant in development review. Um, the proposal before you is a small project change for the previously approved 104 Canal Street Hotel project located in the West End. The 15-story hotel project was originally board approved in October of 2014. At this time, the project is seeking a notice of small project change. The proposed changes include increasing the number of guest rooms from 90 to 98, removing the originally proposed cafe, which is replaced by a smaller cafe amenity for guests, and refinements to the facades. The height, footprint, and square footage of the project remain the same. The proposed project will create an outdoor seating area and redevelop a currently underutilized lot, contributing positively to the Canal Street pedestrian experience. The BPDA held a public meeting on October 20th, 2022, for the proposed project change via Zoom. The meeting was well attended and advertised in the local newspaper and online. Now, before I turn it over to Louis Kraft and BK Bully from Stantec Architecture to begin the presentation, I want to say thank you to the members of the public, elected officials, and city agencies who helped review the proposed 104 Canal Street Hotel notice of project change. Thank you. You can advance the slide, Aaron. Good. Greetings. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Uh, the, the project team is uh, really pleased to be back in front of you here with this project, which is, uh, we feel, an important infill uh, project uh, here in the, the Bullhorns Triangle neighborhood. Uh, as mentioned, this is a 15-story hotel, 98 keys, uh, 149 feet in height, and we feel it's going to be a really positive addition um, to the existing Canal Street fabric. Next slide. The project is located on Canal Street and Valenti Way in the heart of the Bullfinch Triangle. Here we see a view of the uh, existing site, which is a one-story uh, Masonry Bank of America building that is uh, currently not operational. Um, and this also shows the site in the context of the existing uh, Masonry Canal Street buildings. This graphic shows uh, the, the building in the context of uh, development along Canal Street and in the general neighborhood and shows the consistency and the height um, with current and new development. The next view shows a composite aerial, aerial view of that graphic that we just showed you in the context of the project uh, within the Bullfinch Triangle neighborhood. Here we see the existing conditions, the one-story Bank of America building uh, that covers essentially all of the just under 3,600 square foot uh, site uh, fronting Canal Street and also uh, Valenti Way. The proposed ground floor plan uh, puts all of the active uses onto Canal Street and also onto Valenti Way with the main entrance on the corner of Valenti and Canal Street and the building services and circulation pushed towards the interior of the site. There's one below grade uh, floor plan, uh, mostly MEP and back of house spaces, but also houses a fitness center for the guests. Use. Moving up two stories to the second, second floor, um, it's important to note that uh, critical infrastructure transformer vault and switch gear um, is located up on the second floor in accordance with uh, resiliency standards. Also located on this floor is a hospitality room, which the proponent is uh, making available to the community and, and neighborhood for use as a book of space. Move forward one more slide. This is a typical hotel floor plan, typically eight guest rooms per floor, uh, fronting both Canal Street and Valenti Way. And this is a, a roof plan. It's just worth noting that all the mechanicals uh, are intended to be screened um, by the, the rooftop cornice line. 
Here we see a diagrammatic view of the elevations. Uh, the building is designed as a, a detail-rich masonry facade um, that offers a very composed uh, architecture, including two uh, brick detail languages that you'll see, one fronting Canal Street and the other fronting uh, Valenti Way, and strong uh, masonry details and, and cornice line at the top of the building. Here's a composite view showing the, the general disposition of, of the architecture and its, its location in the context of the site uh, with the, the aforementioned uh, brick detailing, a strong vertical nature, and a two-story uh, open read to the uh, building entry. Next we see a view, this is on Canal Street looking back towards Valenti Way and shows a little bit more of the pedestrian experience along Canal Street, which as we know is a very vibrant um, pedestrian experience and we're looking forward to contributing to that experience. Zooming in a little bit further, it shows that the, the open and welcoming nature of the lobby spaces and hospitality space as well and how that's going to front on, directly onto Canal Street and offer to animate the pedestrian experience. And then a little bit more detailed view here that, that shows the, the care and attention that the project team has put towards the brick detailing, including working with uh, BPDA urban design staff. And, and another view rotating around now seeing the project as it turns on to, to Valenti Way. And the next view, zooming in a little bit more, showing the uh, masonry water table details, uh, the brick coursing, projecting group for coursing and then the, the strong cornice line um, that, that finishes off the top expression of the building. Here's a final view looking back towards the garden. And we'll advance just one more slide uh, to say thank you uh, to, to the board and uh, looking forward to any questions that there may be. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? I have two questions, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Kraft, is, has the general contractor been selected <clears throat> first in the brickwork? Is it real brick or veneer? Sure, I can answer both questions. Um, a general contractor has not been selected at, at this time, um, but it, it will be in the future. And uh, this has been designed as, as real laid up brick, no panelized uh, or, or otherwise. Thanks. Yep. Additional questions or comments? I like the brick and it's real. <laughs> it's really great. Um, Thank you. Awesome. So uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Ginsburg. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great job, Aaron. <laughs> um, item number 29. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of an 80-room hotel with a ground floor cafe and bike room located at 7 through 9 Hamilton Place. And to take all related actions, we have Caitlin and Kenneth. And pardon me, Madam Chair, this is Brian Miller. I just joined the call. My apologies for uh, my late arrival. No apologies needed. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Yeah, Caitlin or Kenneth, the floor is yours. I think Caitlin's trying to mute. I think so too, yeah. Sorry, my apologies. Okay. Um, it's the, the headset always gets me. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the board, Secretary Polhemus and Director Jemison. Caitlin Coppinger, Senior Project Manager, happy to be here today. The proposal before you is for an Article 80 small project located at 7 to 9 Hamilton Place in downtown. The proposed project contemplates the restoration of an existing three-story building and the addition of nine stories above, totaling 38,400 gross square feet to create a new boutique hotel, totaling 80 rooms. The first floor of the building is proposed to include an entry court into the building, a cafe, and a lobby with a concierge and administrative office and a bike room and a back of house kitchen area. Floor, uh, floors four through 11 will include hotel rooms and the 12th floor will include an amenity space for guests. The project is contributing a number of community benefits and mitigation, including $50,000 to the Blue Bikes program and $50,000 towards the restoration improvements to the Granary building ground. 
This project has also received a letter of support from City Council President Flynn. I'm happy to turn it over to Kenan to explain the planning context for this project. Good afternoon, next slide please. Um, I didn't introduce myself last time very rudely. I'm Kenan Ryan, I'm the Deputy Director for Downtown and Newburgh Planning and I was one of the reviewers on this project team. Um, I am formerly the Project Manager for Plan Downtown. You met Andrew Namias earlier, he's now taking over that plan. Plan Downtown paused in 2018 for the pandemic and relaunched last week. There are a few key issues here that are relevant for the review of this project. First is that we will be developing a new framework for preservation, enhancement, and growth in downtown. Second is that we want to promote dense mixed-use development to support 18-hour-a-day, 7-day-a-week district. Third uh, is the preservation of historic building fabric. And fourth is to encourage consistent, safe, healthy, and high-quality public improvements to the public realm. Next slide, please. This project is located within the planning area. Um, it's consistent with the draft planning recommendations, specifically the draft requirements um, that relate to uh, urban design guidance. Uh, it provides an enhanced public realm and street activation of downtown's unique alleyways and side streets. Maintains the character, continuity, and scale of the ladder blocks through the restoration of an existing 18th century facade. Supports surrounding ground floor businesses and encourages that longer 18 hour day, seven day a week environment, um, specifically being located along the Freedom Trail. And then finally, very important to um, residents and constituents in this area, it complies with the shadow regulations for the Boston Common and Public Garden, which govern height requirements in this district. Thank you very much, and I will turn it over to the proponents. Thank you, Kenan. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Secretary, members of the board, and uh, Director Jemison. I'm Don Weiss, permanent counsel for the project. With me tonight are Josh Federman from the Proponent City Realty Group and Eric Robinson from our design uh, team at Rody. Before beginning, I'd like to thank uh, Caitlin Coppinger for expert project management all the way through. Uh, it's great to be here tonight. There are a couple um, distinctly exciting things about this project, uh, which we are uh, really pleased to be showing you. One is um, this boutique hotel is going to bring light and activity and eyes on the street to what is often a dark and somewhat isolated corner uh, of the city uh, after hours. Um, and secondly, <clears throat> there's a very interesting design solution uh, that's been brought to this site. Um, the existing building, uh, uh, which uh, uh, staff uh, just described is uh, dilapidated and you walk past it a dozen times and not notice it. A normal approach might be to take that building down and start from a clean uh, slate, but we have a very strong design lead uh, in the roadie team. Uh, they saw a lot of potential in retaining the facade of this building, uh, restoring it and creating an elegant, uh, somewhat dainty uh, 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 pedestal uh, and then bringing out of that pedestal a, an elegant, clean line, very modern uh, tower at with hotel rooms above. And so, as you'll see uh, when we move into the design discussion here, um, there's a really beautiful marriage of old and new at this site. This is uh, going to be a real jewel box of a uh, contribution to downtown Boston. Uh, with that, why don't we turn to the next slide, please? Um, Many people on the board will be familiar with the location here. Uh, we are just off Tremont Street uh, on Hamilton Place, one of the ladder blocks, which terminates at the Orphan Theater. Next slide, please. Actually, I will pass this over to Eric Robinson from Rody. I'll just mention before passing on, that one of the goals of the project is to, is to be uh, fully compliant with the uh, zoning for the site. That is one of the challenges we set ourselves and Rody has done an excellent job fitting the 80 room boutique hotel into the uh, as a right zone. Eric. Thanks, Don. Uh, again, good evening, everybody. Eric Robinson, Rody Architects. We are excited to be here um, for such an uh, interesting and uh, complicated project. If we could just jump back one slide to the uh, site plan, that'd be great. Because I think the context means everything here for this project. Um, we have been working very closely with our butters at Suffolk University and the Orpheum Theater to ensure that this small place, Hamilton Place, is really sort of celebrated in its future. And we want to be super respectful of their operations 
and what they represent, and we're looking forward to bringing a building to this small area that will enhance the quality of their different activities in terms of the Orpheum. So as you can sort of see where it is, right off of um, the corner of Tremont Street, Park Street Church is directly adjacent to us at the end of our um, street, and then the common is there at the corner. So a very tight site, for sure. It's about 5,000 square feet. Um, surrounded by buildings and our ultimate floor plate which you'll see is actually more like 4800 so it's a very very tight program but we think it's awesome because it represents we're meeting the zoning for this area and it'll also enhance the quality of life in this area next slide so this is the building in its current state um, really you know when we first saw it we were also a little like ah, well you know what's this building we've been down this alley many times or this place many times, never really recognized it. It's fairly underwhelming as it relates to the streetscape. However, once we started working on the project, we were able to discover the next slide, which is what the building was in its active state. And so this really inspired both us as a design team, the ownership team, and Josh. And you know, we thought that this can be something super special and exciting on this block. So we took a lot of cues from the existing building, especially looking at the ground floor plane where you can see large glass and open areas that connect the street to the interior and activation of the building itself. We don't have a lot of public realm to work with, so some of those cues we're taking on actually bringing the public into our space and onto our site to allow for hotel guests to have a, a place to drop and come in and have a little bit of respite off of the place, especially if there's a, a concert going on. Um, so a lot of complexity within this small context, but really we are hoping to celebrate the history of this building with its new future as we look to the renovation. Next slide. We did a lot of research and thinking and looking around in the Ladder Blocks community to see what architecture is there, what historic architecture is there, um, how is it embraced different materiality. We love some of these detailing and sort of the nod to bays, which is something that's very strong in this area. And then we also wanted to look at something that's vertical, setting apart itself and complementing, we think, the horizontal aspect of the existing building. Next slide. So looking at the ground floor plan, which again is not very big, but we are using this front entry court area as a, a relief for the guests in the hotel and creating a, a special little, as Don says, jewel box area for the uh, guests to sort of relax and have a respite in, but also create activity on the street that is outdoor and also framed by indoor in terms of the lobby. And we are also adding a small cafe lounge area that will be activated by the Yes, but also open to the public. Um, so this is a really exciting ground floor plan as it relates to this small place. But we've learned this place is actually quite active. Um, a lot of folks actually move through it um, to get into some of the adjacent tenant spaces. Um, and so it's really quite active. And so we're looking to enhance the quality of this space through our ground floor plan. Next slide, please. So as we talked about, so this is an as of right project. So we're allowed to go to 125 feet, which is what we are doing. We're looking at uh, the ground floor, as we talked about, will be uh, activated with public space. Then the room floor plate starts. So actually we're excited the first two levels of the rooms, which will have eight rooms per floor, will actually be in the existing building. We're gonna activate those uh, bay windows and have those part of the experience for some of the um, hotel uh, uh, visitors and guests. But then as you move up above that, we wanted to have something, a contemporary modern approach that embraces some of those materiality of the uh, different buildings within the neighborhood. So we're looking at a metal and glass uh, vertical um, expression of the addition as it moves out of the existing historical building. And then we're incorporating a series of bay structures in a little bit of a different way um, a little more forward-looking that start to capture some of the amazing views that occur around our building. And so we're really thinking about this as a 360-degree building. There's really no back 
Um, as for you can see a little bit of from Trainmont, you can see a little bit from uh, Downtown Crossing. And so we're excited to sort of see this in the round. Next slide. Just some of the other uh, rear elevations and side elevations. Next slide. Um, the, the rendering of the ground floor, and you can sort of see the activation of that small exterior space. And then as the bays start to grow out of uh, the existing construct of the, the building below. Next slide. So here are a couple other views of just how that starts to frame and work within the skyline. Uh, Left-hand side, you're seeing it from Tremont Street as you look down toward the Orpheum Seat Theater. We're activating the, the roofscape up on the top there with an um, observation or outdoor space for the, the guest residents and um, so they can sort of oversee the park. Uh, beyond and then on the right you can sort of see a little bit more of how we're interpreting the historical bay in a contemporary way um, with the addition above. Next slide. And then just a couple other views um, from around uh, to make sure that we're thinking about every aspect of it and uh, how it fits within its context and really can be a contributor to the very nature of this downtown crossing area. And with that, that's our last slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, questions or comments from the board? Madam Chair, I have a few questions if I could. Mr. Robinson, it, uh, and I love the job. For, uh, more curious on the construction side. Once you get the facade, are you caissons? So we're still looking into that, but we no, we don't believe we'll need caissons. Um, you know, a lot of the discussion, which has been front loaded on this project, is the constructability of this project. Um, and that's really in respect of our neighboring abutters. Um, we will not be uh, driving piles or doing anything. So we're, we're looking at uh, means and methods and construction methodology early in the approvals process to make sure that this project can be delivered. So we're looking at max labs and things of that nature that really don't have um, those kind of uh, vibrational issues and so associated with our abutting uh, neighbors. Curious, what, what's, how many feet would, would a max slab be for something like that? Five. Five feet. And um, concrete or structural? Uh, so uh, in terms of the superstructure? Yeah. So actually right now we're looking at the possibility and we'd like to pursue the possibility of um, doing this out of CLT. Um, so cross laminated timber structure. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, the program actually lends itself very well to it in terms of the footprint, but also the construction methodology is actually quieter in terms of its day-to-day -day operations because of how you put it together. Um, and that is one of the other considerations, I guess, as we're talking about working in a very tight downtown urban neighborhood, we think that might be a right path forward. It's also obviously a very sustainable approach to building and construction is that we're really excited uh, to pursuing. So that is that is our, um, we're working toward that goal in terms of the building uh, superstructure. If you choose that way, I think that will probably be the highest wood structure building we have in the city. Yes, sir, and we hope to celebrate that. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Thank you. And just uh, drawing on uh, Mike's comments there, uh, one of the other uh, uh, timber buildings that you're aware of um, in the city, in, in, within the city at this point. So, th the only one I'm aware of is the one um, over by Boston Water and Sewer uh, on East Lenox Street that's currently wrapping up construction. Um, we actually, it's, uh, and I think it's seven stories. Um, we just took a tour of that recently because we're actually looking at another building about this size in, uh, in another jurisdiction, in Worcester. Um, but, you know, we're starting to see more and more that the CLT um, direction is viable. Uh, the new building code uh, is looking at it, I think, more progressively in a good way. Um, so we can expose more of the sort of benefits and natural benefits, if you, if you may, of the uh, timber in the spaces. And so, you know, we're really excited about this construction method helping us move forward and obviously move the city toward um, their goals in terms of sustainability as well. So, yeah, it's great to see uh, this innovation in a, a downtown urban context. Um, most of what I've seen so far has been kind of out in the country. Agreed. And, uh, 
it's nice to see here. Have you given thought to um, doing anything uh, in terms of your uh, uh, contributions that would um, uh, make this short street even more special? Uh, paving or lighting or anything akin to that because it's just a short street and your next street over which I think is uh, Winter Street maybe um, you know has special paving and the like and uh, it, it might be nice to uh, really set that off and then before you answer my, my last question is um, could you delineate where your handicapped accessibility is Mm -hmm. uh, it appears that it goes in through the cafe or through the, um, the small restaurant space. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that part first, and I'll turn it over to Don to talk a little bit about the benefits. But um, so the, the existing building, you're correct, very good uh, insight there, does step up into the existing first floor. We're taking that first floor out, so we will have a fully accessible um, building from the sidewalk. The actual entrance in um, to the hotel will be on center in the sort of existing central entry place. You can get in through the outdoor space through into the lobby, but the main entrance which will be accessible and it's at the center kind of curved area below the flagpoles um, as it currently sits now, so, which I can show you in a rendering if you want to see, but it's... Um, I'll take your word for that. Thanks. So, Landsmark, you had asked about um, the uh, uh, the street uh, uh, surfacing material. Um, we we saw what it, it sounds like is catching your eye. There's maybe a, a sort of European courtyard feel to this charming little uh, 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 street. Um, it's a privately owned street, however, and it's quite parcelized to different owners. Or there are a number of rights of access going through that street. Uh, we don't actually own the sidewalk in front of the building or the parking spaces out in front. Those are privately separately owned. Those are rented. Um, so it is the case that um, we don't have any control over that street, and it is, uh, is, is commercially rented out a good bit of it. So um, unfortunately, we had focus sort of within our footprint, and we made a couple donations uh, you know, outside our footprint in ways that we thought were, uh, were good for the neighborhood. But we, we absolutely understand where you're coming from with that question. Yeah, you know, when I looked at the uh, vintage photograph, I saw that the two ground floor retail shops uh, that were there were a music shop and what appeared to be a, a, a sort of art shop or a print shop or something like that, uh, you know, going back a century. So it, it appears that that little street at some point, given the theater, um, and some of the retail around it was really intended to be a street that focused on music and the arts. And it would be nice to uh, bring back that, uh, that kind of branding uh, to the street, given that it is so short and given that it is right there in the middle of, uh, of uh, downtown and, and next to some other performance spaces. That's right, it is packed with charm. Uh, we, we do hope to maybe a related uh, theme that we might be able to uh, collaborate with both the Orpheum and Suffolk so that uh, academic folks, folks in the music industry coming through would find this a convenient place to stay. Uh, hopefully there's some benefit in both directions being co-located with, uh, with uh, artistic and academic facilities right nearby. But yeah, the, the building and street are, are packed with charm and we're hoping to help uh, uncover some of that again. Thanks. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair with aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Item number 30. <clears throat> Request authorization to issue a scoping determination waiving further review pursuant to Article 80B-5.3D, Large Project Review of the Zoning Code, for the construction of a mixed-use building consisting of 48 residential rental income-restricted units, including 20% of artist units, 2,000 square feet of residential art space, 4,500 square feet of below-market-rate civic arts and commercial space, and 17 parking spaces located at uh, 568 through 5, 
1074 Columbia Road, known as Columbia Crossing, and to take all related actions, we have Caitlin and Adriana. Thank you again, Madam Chair and members of the board, Secretary Kohimas and Director Jemison. The proposal before you is for an Article 80 large project located at 568 to 574 Columbia Road in Upham's Corner in Dorchester. Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation and Preservation of Affordable Housing are proposing the construction of a six-story new building addition in the back of the existing Dorchester Savings Bank building, as well as the adaptive reuse of the bank building and the creation of what is called the glow box. The new construction and bank building rehabilitation will contain up to 48 units of rental housing in which 20% of those are reserved for artists. Approximately 2,000 square feet of arts amenity space for those residents' use and an additional 4,500 square feet of below market rate civic arts and commercial space. All of the residential units at the proposed project will be income restricted to households that earn no more than 80% of the area median income. This project has received letters of support from Council for, Councilor Frank Baker, State Representative Liz Miranda, and Senator Nick Collins. I'm happy to turn it over to the planning team to further explain the planning context for this project. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Polhemis, and members of the board. My name is Astrid Walker-Stewart, and I'm a neighborhood planner covering Dorchester. The proposed project is located in the heart of Upham's Corner within the planning boundaries of the Upham's Corner Station Area Plan, a planning process which was part of the larger Fairmount Indigo Planning Initiative established in 2012. This plan envisions Upham's Corner as an important cultural hub for the neighborhood with expanded affordable housing and other development that minimizes displacement and preserves the area's rich historic assets. Planning division staff also considered the neighborhood context, adopted citywide plans, including Imagine Boston 2030 and Go Boston 2030, the zoning code, and public feedback to review the project. Next slide, please. The proposed project makes significant progress towards realizing planning goals outlined in the Upham's Corner Station Area Plan, including those of developing mixed income housing near the main street and station area, protecting existing community assets and historic buildings in Upham's Corner, strengthening an active and walkable Main Street District with residential uses, and promoting public art and activities that reinforce the district as a destination for cultural events. The key considerations of BPA staff during review of the proposed project were site access, curbside use, site programming, and landscape and streetscape design. During review, staff also worked to ensure that the proposal's massing and height worked in tandem with surrounding neighborhood contacts and the Fox Hall project at 554 and 562 Columbia Road. I will now turn the presentation over to the proponent team to discuss the project in more detail. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Director Jemison, Madam Chair Rojas, Secretary Polhemis, and the BPDA board for inviting us to present Columbia Crossing to you this evening. I am Beth O'Donnell. I'm the Director of Real Estate for Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation. And I'm pleased to be presenting this project with our architect, David Lee of Stolen Lee. The project team includes uh, developers. Dorchester Bay is a local MBE organization. We've been located in Upham's Corner for over 40 years and working in the immediate area of this project site. And preservation of affordable housing, a Boston-based affordable housing developer with national prominence. The property owner is Dudley Neighbors Inc., an affiliate of Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Uh, the architects are Stolen Lee as design architect and Moody Nolan is architect of record. Landscape architect is a WBE, the collaborative, a permitting consultant uh, who helped us through this process, Beverly Johnson of Bevco. This unique project is a result of an RFP that DNI, Dudley Neighborhood Inc., and DSNI distributed in late 2020. The RFP with years of community engagement and planning preceded it, preceding it identified affordable housing, 
below market arts oriented commercial space and artist live workspace as critical components for the future development for this site. Our team was selected based on this extensive engagement process that also included years of effort by an Upham's Corner Working Area group. The goals for Columbia Crossing are equitable development without displacement, affordable housing for Upham's Corner residents, affordable live and workspace for local artists, and catalyzing development for the Upham's Corner Arts and Innovation District. Here's the project site. It's in the heart of Upham's Corner, which is defined by the intersection of Dudley Street, Stoughton Street, and Columbia Road. Many people know the site as the former Citizens Bank building. Upham's Corner has been envisioned as an arts and innovation district by the community and the city in large part because of the Strand Theater's wonderful president presence in Upham's Corner and across the street from the project site. This area. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a close up of the project site. Uh, from this image, you can see that it's fairly tight. It's an urban infill site. Some of the neighbors include the Masonic Hall building, one of those historic assets that were mentioned earlier, the Fox Hall building on this side, um, Upham's House of Pizza right here, and our neighbors on Virginia Street. Next slide, please. At street level, you can see the historic bank hall building that we will be restoring as part of the project. This was very important to the community. The one-story building to the left will be demolished and the drive lane will be used to access the new parking and residential building. Next slide, please. And David. think after all this time I figure out how to unmute but at any rate uh, just to give you kind of a sense of the building uh, the upper this corner area has a number of really iconic and significant things for the buildings but all of the person characters or let me say at least the wide variety of characters one uh, on our site though Dorchester Bay uh, Savings Bank really stood out to us and uh, I happen to be a Freight machine to Rogers stand on top of it. So, uh, a 1930s art modern building field me as a kind of a design to follow. So, the design actually preserves the wonderful banking hall from the facade of the Rochester Savings Bank. Uh, it masses most of the residential units further back from the street, which allows us to create a forecourt for public activities. And then uh, we're adding what we're calling flow boxes. So the bronze colored uh, facility in the suit front. That's going to be uh, glazed, it's going to permit a lot of white activity at night, and uh, we'll really be the highlight of the area. Uh, we're using a curbless plaza, which will allow us to use the plaza in front of the building for exhibits and activities on nice days to actually spread out from the building. And the building's going to have nano walls that will open up and uh, give some much needed uh, public space. Uh, I'll talk a little more about the past later. Next slide, please. This slide shows the unit breakdown in more detail. Uh, of the 48 income restricted housing units, 65% will be two and three bedroom units. This matches the demographics of the neighborhood. Uh, there is a strong demand for family housing in Upham's Corner. Uh, we've worked hard to match the affordability levels of the units to the needs of the existing community. Next slide, please. This slide begins to talk about the materiality of the building. And uh, we're looking for a green screen to have a panel system along with the metal uh, panels and, uh, and, of course, a lot of glass. Uh, what we're also doing is drawing from the patina of both the bank and a couple of really nice uh, buff colored nature buildings in the neighborhood that are especially attractive to. And so, what we're doing here is kind of weaving those two uh, colors throughout the, uh, the uh, uh, facades of the building. And as you can see, scale-wise, it begins to push a little bit. Uh, the height there, which is back from the street, 
designated as the developers of the site in mid-2021, we have engaged in many community meetings with neighborhood groups, Upham's Corner Main Street, meetings with the Butters and elected officials, and also with arts organizations that may be interested in occupying the commercial space and or glow box in the future. We have met with neighborhood groups from Jones Hill, Hancock Street, and Virginia Street. We have met with the owners of Masonic Hall and Upham's House of Pizza multiple times. We have also met with site neighbors on Virginia Street multiple times. David will now share the evolution of the design based on all of these meetings. Both Dorchester Bay and Poa have a long history of engagement and working within the community process. There's still that and they listen. Uh, in addition to that, we have the input from the parent working group, the uh, impact advisory group, and uh, good advice from both DMD and the DMD, or no, I think the mayor's office of housing now, taking a while to get the same now, uh, and also the DBDA urban planning staff, as well as the Boston Transportation Department. You see this building is really crammed into a pretty tight urban space. So uh, how would you prioritize access to things like that to be important? We started out with the idea of actually building uh, quite a few more units and actually building over the bank building. Uh, after a while, we moved away from that and we were compromised with the historic character of the bank building. And so we pushed the mass in the building further back. We are still at about uh, a little more than you know, maybe about the historic that we remember now. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, we ended up uh, dropping the height of the building and reworking some of the facades to get more glazing. And, uh, and much, uh, how we got to starting the top, we got down to 33. They're also about 17 birds and 20. Uh, We're excited to be here presenting Columbia Crossing to you this evening, and we look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board? I have a question. What, what do you anticipate um, the bank hall building, uh, some of the uses that you might see there? Great question. Uh, we've been talking to uh, arts organizations who would be using the bank hall for potentially shared uh, workspace. We've also uh, you know, spoken um, with creative users um, of all sorts uh, who would be interested in uh, renting that space, being in Upham's Corner, being in proximity 
to the Strand and contributing to the Arts and Innovation District. So uh, we, don't, we don't know how it will be used. We have uh, uh, a strong vision of uh, an Arts and Innovation um, user or, or several for that space. Thank you. The right usage could really add a lot to the streetscape there, so thank you. Okay. So, yep. you don't necessarily see it yet as, as a kind of uh, neighborhood dining spot or something akin to that that would keep people coming and going uh, from it at all hours of the day and night? I guess that's a leading question, but. <laughs> you know, it, it remains to be seen, but we are hoping that it will be activated along with um, uh, performances at the Strand. Uh, so, you know, activated, you know, in the evenings as uh, a place for folks to, uh, to gather and, and uh, celebrate and um, experience culture in Upham's Corner. Also, the upper level of the glow box contains a, a space that's going to be given over to the artists as a kind of working space. So we imagine that any time, day or night, there's going to be people up there with lights on, uh, working in some uh, artistic uh, capacity and looking out. So it could become some sort of uh, highly visible maker space. Exactly. Um, it, it may only be a small detail of your renderings, but I note that between your first and second and then your, your third rendering, you have lost several trees in front of uh, the building. Is that intentional? It's not intentional, but those are probably some pretty sad trees that I remember. But uh, uh, obviously, we're going to do uh, whatever we can to uh, maintain the existing vegetation out there. And, and then finally, just before this meeting, we uh, received kind of a letter of objection from uh, some community folks, I guess, who um, were surprised that this was on the agenda. And, and I'm curious as to whether you could comment on any uh, remaining objections there are, given that you've been through such an extensive uh, uh, process of community engagement and meetings and, and making changes uh, to, to the project. And uh, it's not entirely fair, I guess, to ask you to speak uh, to those objections. But at this stage, why would anyone object to this? I mean, it seems like a really interesting project that meets community needs. Uh, thank you for the, for the question and the opportunity to respond. I, I think what we've heard in Upham's Corner that is that uh, there is no uh, uniform vision necessarily of, uh, of what development should look like there, just like many other neighborhoods in, in Boston. So, while there was extensive community process leading up to the RFP for this site, uh, we responded with a project that met the objectives of the RFP and were selected to develop the site and are now proposing um, along with, along, you know, in accordance with those um, objectives. Uh, we continue to hear lots of uh, differing opinions throughout the neighborhood, um, including some that you know, we, we don't completely disagree with, like people would like to see home ownership opportunities in the neighborhood. That was not an objective of this project, but that's just an example of, um, you know, one item of feedback that we've heard and we don't even necessarily um, disagree with it. So lots of opinions uh, in the neighborhood and lots of change coming and lots of dialogue. Okay, thank you. Okay, any additional questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Vansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, congratulations and good luck.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we are at uh, 540, almost here. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a five minute break. We'll resume at 545 and start the uh, public hearing portion of the meeting um, with item number 35. So uh, we'll see you in five minutes at 545. Thank you.